Chapter six, part one of the further adventures of Robinson Crusoe. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The further adventures of Robinson Crusoe by Daniel Defoe. Chapter six, the French clergyman's council. Part one. Having thus given an account of the colony in general, and pretty much of my runagate Englishmen, I must say something of the Spaniards, who were the main body of the family, and in whose story there are some incidents also remarkable enough. I had a great many discourses with them about their circumstances when they were among the savages. They told me readily that they had no instances to give of their application or ingenuity in that country, that they were a poor, miserable, dejected handful of people, that even if means had been put into their hands, yet they had so abandoned themselves to despair, and were so sunk under the weight of their misfortune, that they thought of nothing but starving. One of them, a grave and sensible man, told me he was convinced they were in the wrong, that it was not the part of wise men to give themselves up to their misery, but always to take hold of the helps which reason offered, as well for present support as for future deliverance. He told me that grief was the most senseless, insignificant passion in the world, for that it regarded only things past which were generally impossible to be recalled or to be remedied but had no views of things to come, and had no share in anything that looked like deliverance, but rather added to the affliction than proposed a remedy. And upon this he repeated a Spanish proverb, which, though I cannot repeat it in the same words that he spoke it in, yet I remember I made it into an English proverb of my own, thus, In trouble to be troubled is to have your trouble doubled. He then ran on in remarks upon all the little improvements I had made in my solitude, my unwearied application, as he called it, and how I had made a condition, which in its circumstances was at first much worse than theirs, a thousand times more happy than theirs was, even now when they were all together. He told me it was remarkable that Englishmen had a greater presence of mind in their distress than any people that ever he met with, that their unhappy nation and the Portuguese were the worst men in the world to struggle with misfortunes, for that their first step in dangers, after the common efforts were over, was to despair, lie down under it, and die, without rousing their thoughts up to proper remedies for escape. I told him their case and mine differed exceedingly, that they were cast upon the shore without necessaries, without supply of food, or present sustenance till they could provide for it, that, it was true, I had this further disadvantage and discomfort, that I was alone, but then the supplies I had providentially thrown into my hands, by the unexpected driving of the ship on the shore, was such a help as would have encouraged any creature in the world to have applied himself as I had done. Senor, says the Spaniard, had we poor Spaniards been in your case, we should never have got half those things out of the ship, as you did. Nay, says he, we should never have found means to have got a raft to carry them, or to have got the raft on shore without boat or sail, and how much less should we have done if any of us had been alone? Well, I desired him to abate his compliments, and go on with the history of their coming on shore, where they landed. He told me they unhappily landed at a place where there were people without provisions, whereas, had they had the common sense to put off to sea again, and gone to another island a little further, they had found provisions, though without people, there being an island that way, as they had been told, where there were provisions, though no people, that is to say, that the Spaniards of Trinidad had frequently been there, and had filled the island with goats and hogs at several times, where they had bred in such multitudes, and where turtle and sea-fowls were in such plenty, that they could have been in no want of flesh, though they had found no bread, whereas here they were only sustained with a few roots and herbs, which they understood not, and which had no substance in them, and which the inhabitants gave them sparingly enough, and they could treat them no better, unless they would turn cannibals and eat men's flesh. They gave me an account how many ways they strove to civilize the savages they were with, and to teach them rational customs in the ordinary way of living, but in vain, and how they retorted upon them as unjust that they who came there for assistance and support should attempt to set up for instructors to those who gave them food, 
intimating it seems that none should set up for the instructors of others but those who could live without them they gave me dismal accounts of the extremities they were driven to how sometimes they were many days without any food at all the island they were upon being inhabited by a sort of savages that lived more indolent and for that reason were less supplied with the necessaries of life than they had reason to believe others were in the same part of the world and yet they found that these savages were less ravenous and voracious than those who had better supplies of food also they added they could not but see what demonstrations of wisdom and goodness the governing providence of god directs the events of things in this world which they said appeared in their circumstances for if pressed by the hardships they were under and the barrenness of the country where they were they had searched after a better to live in they had then been out of the way of the relief that happened to them by my means they then gave me an account how the savages whom they lived amongst expected them to go out with them into their wars and it was true that as they had firearms with them had they not had the disaster to lose their ammunition they could have been serviceable not only to their friends but have made themselves terrible both to friends and enemies but being without powder and shot and yet in a condition that they could not in reason decline to go out with their landlords to their wars so when they came into the field of battle they were in a worse condition than the savages themselves for they had neither bows nor arrows nor could they use those the savages gave them so they could do nothing but stand still and be wounded with arrows till they came up to the teeth of the enemy and then indeed the three halberds they had were of use to them and they would often drive a whole little army before them with those halberds and sharpened sticks put into the muzzles of their muskets but for all this they were sometimes surrounded with multitudes and in great danger from their arrows till at last they found the way to make themselves large targets of wood which they covered with skins of wild beasts whose names they knew not and these covered them from the arrows of the savages that notwithstanding these they were sometimes in great danger and five of them were once knocked down together with the clubs of the savages which was the time when one of them was taken prisoner that is to say the spaniard whom i relieved at first they thought he had been killed but when they afterwards heard he was taken prisoner they were under the greatest grief imaginable and would willingly have all ventured their lives to have rescued him they told me that when they were so knocked down the rest of their company rescued them and stood over them fighting till they were come to themselves all but him whom they thought had been dead and then they made their way with their halberds and pieces standing close together in a line through a body of above a thousand savages beating down all that came in their way got the victory over their enemies but to their great sorrow because it was with the loss of their friend whom the other party finding alive carried off with some others as i gave an account before they described most affectionately how they were surprised with joy at the return of their friend and companion in misery who they thought had been devoured by wild beasts of the worst kind wild men and yet how more and more they were surprised with the account he gave them of his errand and that there was a christian in any place near much more one that was able and had humanity enough to contribute to their deliverance they described how they were astonished at the sight of the relief i sent them and at the appearance of loaves of bread things they had not seen since their coming to that miserable place how often they crossed it and blessed it as bread sent from heaven and what a reviving cordial it was to their spirits to taste it as also the other things i had sent for their supply and after all they would have told me something of the joy they were in at the sight of a boat and pilots to carry them away to the person and place from whence all these new comforts came but it was impossible to express it by words for their excessive joy naturally driving them to unbecoming extravagances they had no way to describe them but by telling me they bordered upon lunacy having no way to give vent to their passions suitable to the sense that was upon them that in some it worked one way and in some another and that some of them through a surprise of joy would burst into tears others be stark mad and others immediately faint this discourse extremely affected me and called to my mind friday's ecstasy when he met his father and the poor people's ecstasy when i took them up at sea after their ship was on fire 
the joy of the mate of the ship when he found himself delivered in the place where he expected to perish, and my own joy, when after twenty-eight years' captivity I found a good ship ready to carry me to my own country. All these things made me more sensible of the relation of these poor men, and more affected with it. Having thus given a view of the state of things as I found them, I must relate the heads of what I did for these people, and the condition in which I left them. It was their opinion, and mine too, that they would be troubled no more with the savages, or if they were, they would be able to cut them off, if they were twice as many as before, so they had no concern about that. Then I entered into a serious discourse with the Spaniard, whom I call Governor, about their stay in the island, for as I was not come to carry any of them off, so it would not be just to carry off some and leave others, who, perhaps, would be unwilling to stay if their strength was diminished. On the other hand, I told them I came to establish them there, not to remove them, and then I let them know that I had brought with me relief of sundry kinds for them, that I had been at a great charge to supply them with all things necessary, as well for their convenience as their defence, and that I had such and such particular persons with me, as well to increase and recruit their number, as by the particular necessary employments which they were bred to, being artificers, to assist them in those things in which at present they were in want. They were all together when I talked thus to them, and before I delivered to them the stores I had brought, I asked them, one by one, if they had entirely forgot and buried the first animosities that had been among them, and would shake hands with one another, and engage in a strict friendship and union of interest, that so there might be no more misunderstandings and jealousies. Will Atkins, with abundance of frankness and good humour, said they had met with affliction enough to make them all sober, and enemies enough to make them all friends, that for his part he would live and die with them, and was so far from designing anything against the Spaniards, that he owned they had done nothing to him but what his own mad humour made necessary, and what he would have done, and perhaps worse, in their case, and that he would ask them pardon if I desired it, for the foolish and brutish things he had done to them, and was very willing and desirous of living in terms of entire friendship and union with them, and would do anything that lay in his power to convince them of it. And as for going to England, he cared not if he did not go thither these twenty years. The Spaniards said they had, indeed, at first disarmed and excluded Will Atkins and his two countrymen for their ill conduct, as they had let me know, and they appealed to me for the necessity they were under to do so, but that Will Atkins had behaved himself so bravely in the great fight they had with the savages, and on several occasions since, and had showed himself so faithful to, and concerned for, the general interest of them all, that they had forgotten all that was past, and thought he merited as much to be trusted with arms and supplied with necessaries as any of them, that they had testified their satisfaction in him by committing the command to him next to the governor himself, and as they had entire confidence in him and all his countrymen, so they acknowledged they had merited that confidence by all the methods that honest men could merit to be valued and trusted, and they most heartily embraced the occasion of giving me this assurance that they would never have any interest separate from one another. Upon these frank and open declarations of friendship, we appointed the next day to dine all together, and indeed we made a splendid feast. I caused the ship's cook and his mate to come on shore and dress our dinner, and the old cook's mate we had on shore assisted. We brought on shore six pieces of good beef and four pieces of pork, out of the ship's provisions, with our punch-bowl and materials to fill it, and in particular I gave them ten bottles of French claret, and ten bottles of English beer, things that neither the Spaniards nor the English had tasted for many years, and which it may be supposed they were very glad of. The Spaniards added to our feast five whole kids, which the cooks roasted, and three of them were sent, covered up close, on board the ship to the seamen, that they might feast on fresh meat from on shore, as we did with their salt meat from on board. 
after this feast at which we were very innocently merry i brought my cargo of goods wherein that there might be no dispute about dividing i showed them that there was a sufficiency for them all desiring that they might take an equal quantity when made up of the goods that were for wearing at first i distributed linen sufficient to make every one of them four shirts and at the spaniard's request afterwards made them up six these were exceeding comfortable to them having been what they had long since forgot the use of or what it was to wear them i allotted the thin english stuffs which i mentioned before to make every one a light coat like a frock which i judged fittest for the heat of the season cool and loose and ordered that whenever they decayed they should make more as they thought fit the like for pumps shoes stockings hats etc i cannot express what pleasure sat upon the countenances of all these poor men when they saw the care i had taken of them and how well i had furnished them they told me i was a father to them and that having such a correspondent as i was in so remote a part of the world it would make them forget that they were left in a desolate place and they all voluntarily engaged to me not to leave the place without my consent then i presented to them the people i had brought with me particularly the tailor the smith and the two carpenters all of them most necessary people but above all my general artificer than whom they could not name anything that was more useful to them and the tailor to show his concern for them went to work immediately and with my leave made them every one a shirt the first thing he did and what was still more he taught the women not only how to sew and stitch and use the needle but made them assist to make the shirts for their husbands and for all the rest as to the carpenters i scarce need mention how useful they were for they took to pieces all my clumsy unhandy things and made clever convenient tables stools bedsteads cupboards lockers shelves and everything they wanted of that kind but to let them see how nature made artificers at first i carried the carpenters to see will atkins basket house as i called it and they both owned they never saw an instance of such natural ingenuity before nor anything so regular and so handily built at least of its kind and one of them when he saw it after musing a good while turning about to me i am sure says he that man has no need of us you need do nothing but give him tools then i brought them out all my store of tools and gave every man a digging spade a shovel and a rake for we had no barrows or ploughs and to every separate place a pickaxe a crow a broad axe and a saw always appointing that as often as any were broken or worn out they should be supplied without grudging out of the general stores that i left behind nails staples hinges hammers chisels knives scissors and all sorts of iron work they had without reserve as they required for no man would take more than he wanted and he must be a fool that would waste or spoil them on any account whatever and for the use of the smith i left two tons of unwrought iron for a supply my magazine of powder and arms which i brought them was such even to profusion that they could not but rejoice at them for now they could march as i used to with a musket upon each shoulder if there was occasion and were able to fight a thousand savages if they had but some little advantages of situation which also they could not miss if they had occasion i carried on shore with me the young man whose mother was starved to death and the maid also she was a sober well-educated religious young woman and behaved so inoffensively that every one gave her a good word she had indeed an unhappy life with us there being no woman in the ship but herself but she bore it with patience after a while seeing things so well ordered and in so fine a way of thriving upon my island and considering that they had neither business nor acquaintance in the east indies or reason for taking so long a voyage both of them came to me and desired i would give them leave to remain on the island and be entered among my family as they called it i agreed to this readily and they had a little plot of ground allotted to them where they had three tents or houses set up surrounded with a basket-work palisado like atkins's adjoining to his plantation their tents were contrived so that they had each of them a room apart to lodge in and a middle tent like a great storehouse to lay their goods in and to eat and to drink in 
and now the other two Englishmen removed their habitation to the same place, and so the island was divided into three colonies, and no more, viz. the Spaniards with Old Friday and the first servants, at my habitation under the hill, which was, in a word, the capital city, and where they had so enlarged and extended their works, as well under as on the outside of the hill, that they lived, though perfectly concealed, yet full at large. Never was there such a little city in a wood, and so hid, in any part of the world. For I verily believe that a thousand men might have ranged the island a month, and, if they had not known there was such a thing, and looked on purpose for it, they would not have found it. Indeed, the trees stood so thick and so close, and grew so fast woven one into another, that nothing but cutting them down first could discover the place, except the only two narrow entrances, where they went in and out could be found, which was not very easy. One of them was close down at the water's edge, on the side of the creek, and it was afterwards above two hundred yards to the place, and the other was up a ladder at twice, as I have already described it, and they had also a large wood, thickly planted, on the top of the hill, containing above an acre, which grew apace, and concealed the place from all discovery there, with only one narrow place between the two trees, not easily to be discovered, to enter on that side. The other colony was that of Will Atkins, where there were four families of Englishmen. I mean those I had left there, with their wives and children, three savages that were slaves, the widow and children of the Englishman that was killed, the young man and the maid, and, by the way, we made a wife of her before we went away. There were besides the two carpenters and the tailor, whom I brought with me for them, also the smith, who was a very necessary man to them, especially as a gunsmith, to take care of their arms, and my other man, whom I called Jack of all Trades, who was in himself as good almost as twenty men, for he was not only a very ingenious fellow, but a very merry fellow, and before I went away we married him to the honest maid that came with the youth in the ship I mentioned before. And now I speak of marrying, it brings me naturally to say something of the French ecclesiastic that I had brought with me out of the ship's crew whom I took up at sea. It is true this man was a Roman, and perhaps it may give offence to some hereafter if I leave anything extraordinary upon record of a man whom, before I begin, I must, to set him out in just colours, represent in terms very much to his disadvantage, in the account of Protestants, as, first, that he was a papist, secondly, a popish priest, and thirdly, a French popish priest. But justice demands of me to give him a due character, and I must say, he was a grave, sober, pious, and most religious person, exact in his life, extensive in his charity, and exemplary in almost everything he did. What, then, can any one say against being very sensible of the value of such a man, notwithstanding his profession? though it may be my opinion, perhaps, as well as the opinion of others who shall read this, that he was mistaken. The first hour that I began to converse with him, after he had agreed to go with me to the East Indies, I found reason to delight exceedingly in his conversation, and he first began with me about religion in the most obliging manner imaginable. Sir, says he, you have not only under God, and at that he crossed his breast, saved my life, but you have admitted me to go this voyage in your ship, and by your obliging civility have taken me into your family, giving me an opportunity of free conversation. Now, sir, you see by my habit what my profession is, and I guess by your nation what yours is. I may think it is my duty, and doubtless it is so, to use my utmost endeavours, on all occasions, to bring all the souls I can to the knowledge of the truth, and to embrace the Catholic doctrine. But as I am here under your permission, and in your family, I am bound in justice to your kindness, as well as in decency and good manners, to be under your government, and therefore I shall not, without your leave, enter into any debate on the points of religion in which we may not agree, further than you shall give me leave." I told him his carriage was so modest that I could not but acknowledge it, that it was true we were such people as they call heretics, but that he was not the first Catholic I had conversed with, without falling into inconveniences, or carrying the questions to any height in debate, 
that he should not find himself the worse used for being of a different opinion from us and if we did not converse without any dislike on either side it should be his fault not ours he replied that he thought all our conversation might be easily separated from disputes that it was not his business to cap principles with every man he conversed with and that he rather desired me to converse with him as a gentleman than as a religionist and that if i would give him leave at any time to discourse upon religious subjects he would readily comply with it and that he did not doubt but i would allow him also to defend his own opinions as well as he could but that without my leave he would not break in upon me with any such thing he told me further that he would not cease to do all that became him in his office as a priest as well as a private christian to procure the good of the ship and the safety of all that was in her and though perhaps we would not join with him and he could not pray with us he hoped he might pray for us which he would do upon all occasions in this manner we conversed and as he was of the most obliging gentlemanlike behaviour so he was if i may be allowed to say so a man of good sense and as i believe of great learning he gave me a most diverting account of his life and of the many extraordinary events of it of many adventures which had befallen him in the few years that he had been abroad in the world and particularly it was very remarkable that in the voyage he was now engaged in he had had the misfortune to be five times shipped and unshipped and never to go to the place whither any of the ships he was in were at first designed that his first intent was to have gone to martinico and that he went on board a ship bound thither at st malo but being forced into lisbon by bad weather the ship received some damage by running aground in the mouth of the river tagus and was obliged to unload her cargo there but finding a portuguese ship there bound for the madeiras and ready to sail and supposing he should meet with a ship there bound to martinico he went on board in order to sail to the madeiras but the master of the portuguese ship being an indifferent mariner had been out of his reckoning and they drove to fayal where however he happened to find a very good market for his cargo which was corn and therefore resolved not to go to the madeiras but to load salt at the isle of may and to go away to newfoundland he had no remedy in this exigence but to go with the ship and had a pretty good voyage as far as the banks so they call the place where they catch the fish where meeting with a french ship bound from france to quebec and from thence to martinico to carry provisions he thought he should have an opportunity to complete his first design but when he came to quebec the master of the ship died and the vessel proceeded no further so the next voyage he shipped himself for france in the ship that was burned when we took them up at sea and then shipped with us for the east indies as i have already said thus he had been disappointed in five voyages all as i may call it in one voyage besides what i shall have occasion to mention further of him but i shall not make digression into other men's stories which have no relation to my own so i return to what concerns our affair in the island he came to me one morning for he lodged among us all the while we were upon the island and it happened to be just when i was going to visit the englishman's colony at the furthest part of the island i say he came to me and told me with a very grave countenance that he had for two or three days desired an opportunity of some discourse with me which he hoped would not be displeasing to me because he thought it might in some measure correspond with my general design which was the prosperity of my new colony and perhaps might put it at least more than he yet thought it was in the way of god's blessing i looked a little surprised at the last of his discourse and turning a little short how sir said i can it be said that we are not in the way of god's blessing after such visible assistances and deliverances as we have seen here and of which i have given you a large account if you had pleased sir said he with a world of modesty and yet great readiness to have heard me you would have found no room to have been displeased much less to think so hard of me that i should suggest that you have not had wonderful assistances and deliverances and i hope on your behalf that you are in the way of god's blessing and your design is exceeding good and will prosper 
but sir though it were more so than is even possible to you yet there may be some among you that are not equally right in their actions and you know that in the story of the children of israel one achan in the camp removed god's blessing from them and turned his hand so against them that six and thirty of them though not concerned in the crime were the objects of divine vengeance and bore the weight of that punishment i was sensibly touched with this discourse and told him his inference was so just and the whole design seemed so sincere and was really so religious in its own nature that i was very sorry i had interrupted him and begged him to go on and in the meantime because it seemed that what we had both to say might take up some time i told him i was going to the englishman's plantations and asked him to go with me and we might discourse of it by the way he told me he would the more willingly wait on me thither because there partly the thing was acted which he desired to speak to me about so we walked on and i pressed him to be free and plain with me in what he had to say why then sir said he be pleased to give me leave to lay down a few propositions as the foundation of what i have to say that we may not differ in the general principles though we may be of some differing opinions in the practice of particulars first sir though we differ in some of the doctrinal articles of religion and it is very unhappy it is so especially in the case before us as i shall show afterwards yet there are some general principles in which we both agree that there is a god and that this god having given us some stated general rules for our service and obedience we ought not willingly and knowingly to offend him either by neglecting to do what he has commanded or by doing what he has expressly forbidden and let our different religions be what they will this general principle is readily owned by us all that the blessing of god does not ordinarily follow presumptuous sinning against his command and every good christian will be affectionately concerned to prevent any that are under his care living in a total neglect of god and his commands it is not your men being protestants whatever my opinion may be of such that discharges me from being concerned for their souls and from endeavouring if it lies before me that they should live in as little distance from enmity with their maker as possible especially if you give me leave to meddle so far in your circuit i could not yet imagine what he aimed at and told him i granted all he had said and thanked him that he would so far concern himself for us and begged he would explain the particulars of what he had observed that like joshua to take his own parable i might put away the accursed thing from us why then sir says he i will take the liberty you give me and there are three things which if i am right must stand in the way of god's blessing upon your endeavours here and which i should rejoice for your sake and their own to see removed and sir i promise myself that you will fully agree with me in them all as soon as i name them especially because i shall convince you that every one of them may with great ease and very much to your satisfaction be remedied first sir says he you have here four englishmen who have fetched women from among the savages and have taken them as their wives and have had many children by them all and yet are not married to them after any stated legal manner as the laws of god and man require to this sir i know you will object that there was no clergyman or priest of any kind to perform the ceremony nor any pen and ink or paper to write down a contract of marriage and have it signed between them and i know also sir what the spaniard governor has told you i mean of the agreement that he obliged them to make when they took these women viz that they should choose them out by consent and keep separately to them which by the way is nothing of a marriage no agreement with the women as wives but only an agreement among themselves to keep them from quarrelling but sir the essence of the sacrament of matrimony so he called it being a roman consists not only in the mutual consent of the parties to take one another as man and wife but in the formal and legal obligation to own and acknowledge each other obliging the man to abstain from all other women to engage in no other contract while these subsist and on all occasions as ability allows to provide honestly for them and their children and to oblige the women to the same or like conditions on their side 
now sir says he these men may when they please or when occasion presents abandon these women disown their children leave them to perish and take other women and marry them while these are living and here he added with some warmth how sir is god honoured in this unlawful liberty and how shall a blessing succeed your endeavours in this place however good in themselves and however sincere in your design while these men who at present are your subjects live under your absolute government and dominion are allowed by you to live in open adultery i confess i was struck with the thing itself but much more with the convincing arguments he supported it with but i thought to have got off my young priest by telling him that all that part was done when i was not there and that they had lived so many years with them now that if it was adultery it was past remedy nothing could be done in it now sir says he asking your pardon for such freedom you are right in this that it being done in your absence you could not be charged with that part of the crime but i beseech you flatter not yourself that you are not therefore under an obligation to do your utmost now to put an end to it you shall legally and effectually marry them and as sir my way of marrying may not be easy to reconcile them to though it will be effectual even by your own laws so your way may be as well before god and as valid among men i mean by a written contract signed by both man and woman and by all the witnesses present which all the laws of europe would decree to be valid i was amazed to see so much true piety and so much sincerity of zeal besides the usual impartiality in his discourse as to his own party or church and such true warmth for preserving people that he had no knowledge of or relation to from transgressing the laws of god but recollecting what he had said of marrying them by a written contract which i knew he would stand to i returned it back upon him and told him i granted all that he said to be just and on his part very kind that i would discourse with the men upon the point now when i came to them and i knew no reason why they should scruple to let him marry them all which i knew well enough would be granted to be as authentic and valid in england as if they were married by one of our own clergymen i then pressed him to tell me what was the second complaint which he had to make acknowledging that i was very much his debtor for the first and thanking him heartily for it he told me he would use the same freedom and plainness in the second and hoped i would take it as well and this was that notwithstanding these english subjects of mine as he called them had lived with these women almost seven years had taught them to speak english and even to read it and that they were as he perceived women of tolerable understanding and capable of instruction yet they had not to this hour taught them anything of the christian religion no not so much as to know there was a god or a worship or in what manner god was to be served or that their own idolatry and worshipping they knew not whom was false and absurd this he said was an unaccountable neglect and what god would certainly call them to account for and perhaps at last take the work out of their hands he spoke this very affectionately and warmly End of chapter six part one